This is an audio slide set from the Mountain Plains AIDS Education and Training Center. The topic is HIV epidemiology in the United States, and my name is Lucy Bradley Springer. This map gives you an idea of the distribution of HIV infection across the country. Although all states in the country are affected by HIV, you can clearly see that the epidemic is concentrated along the east and west coast, but most especially in the southeast part of the country. This slide shows the evolution of transmission categories over time. In 1985, near the beginning of the epidemic in the United States, two-thirds of the cases of HIV were attributed to men having sex with men. A small percentage were heterosexually transmitted, and injection drug use was the transmission mode for about 20% of the cases. In 2011, male-to-male -male sexual activity was still the majority means of transmission, but only by a small percent. Heterosexual transmission had increased significantly, and the IDU and other categories had decreased. What this tells me is that HIV is predominantly a sexually transmitted disease. The HIV continuum of care is also known as the spectrum of care. The continuum of care provides a framework to look at a number of epidemiological issues. In the United States, we currently estimate about 1.2 million cases of HIV infection. It is important to remember that this is not a static number and that about 50,000 new cases of HIV occur each year. One of the epidemiological concepts that's very important is demonstrated in the first drop-off in the spectrum of care. This column shows that of the 1.2 million people estimated to be infected, only about 82% have been tested and diagnosed with HIV. This means that 18% of the people living with HIV do not know that they are infected. This is important from a personal health perspective because if you know you're infected, you are more likely to seek the services you need to get treatment and to improve your health. This is also important from a public health perspective because people who know they are infected are more likely to do things to prevent transmission to their sexual and drug-using partners. The next drop-off shows that not all people who are diagnosed with HIV are linked to appropriate care and services. This is a necessary step in helping people live longer and healthier with HIV infection. It also tells me that we have a lot of work to do to make sure that those linkages happen. The next drop-off is fairly significant. It shows that just because you are linked to care does not mean that you are retained in care. HIV is a chronic infection. People who do the best with this infection are those who see their health care providers on a regular basis. In the case of HIV infection, this means at least twice a year. The next two drop-offs in the cascade are not quite so drastic. This shows that people who are linked to care and retained in care can receive the services that they need to attain a suppressed viral load. A suppressed viral load is the primary goal of antiretroviral therapy. Although it is good news that people in care can attain a suppressed viral load, when you look at the entire picture, you see that only 25% of the 1.2 million people living in the United States with HIV are receiving the services they need to have the best clinical outcome. The HIV continuum of care can be used in a variety of ways. One of the best ways is to look at specific populations. So this slide, for instance, shows what is happening with young people who are HIV infected in the United States. It is clear from this graph that the drop-offs are much more severe than we saw in the last slide, and that youth need special attention in the HIV epidemic. 
I'd like to talk about a couple of trends in HIV, and the first one is related to the fact that HIV is more common in disenfranchised populations, which I define as those who do not have access to resources and those who are stigmatized. The first of these is poverty, and I think it's probably the most important of all of these issues. And this is demonstrated in this graph. If you look at it, it, there are clear demarcations between your annual income and the amount of HIV. And basically it says that the poorer you are, the higher the prevalence of HIV. Another group of people who suffer from stigma and discrimination in the United States are people of color. I used to hate to show this slide because it felt very racist to me. And I would usually make comments about social or economic or cultural issues that were related to the stigma, but it still felt very racist. But then I found this graph. This graph shows that black people in the United States do indeed have a much higher prevalence rate of HIV infection than Hispanic people, and Hispanic people have a higher prevalence rate than white people. The thing that makes a difference on this chart is if you look at the other side. And what it shows is that if we look only at U.S. poverty areas, the differences by race disappear. This further makes me think that the biggest issue in this epidemic is poverty. The people who have probably received the most stigma and discrimination related to HIV infection in the United States are probably men who have sex with men. If we look at a chart of all men in the United States who are living with HIV infection, you can see that 78% of them were infected by having sex with other men. Heterosexual sex is also a risk factor for men, as well as injection drug use. If we look at a history of the epidemic among men who have sex with men in the United States, you can see that in the early days, the epidemic mainly affected white men. As this group of men's rate decreased, we now have a situation where the rates of infection among white, black, and Hispanic men are somewhat comparable. However, if you look at these data, which represent new HIV infections in men who have sex with men in 2010, you will notice that in the black data set, the red bar is extremely high. This red bar represents young African American men who have sex with men. That red bar is higher than for any other age group, and it is also higher than for any of the bars in the Hispanic and white data sets we have an emerging epidemic among young black men who have sex with men. In the United States, women and girls of all ages also have problems with being disenfranchised. This occurs for a number of psychosocial and economic reasons as well as for cultural reasons. We also know that it is easier to infect a woman with any sexually transmitted disease than to infect a man, and this includes HIV. In fact, if we look at the global epidemic, you can see that half of the people living in the world with HIV infection are women. The rates are higher for Sub-Saharan Africa and the Caribbean, and then the rates are less than 50%. The rates for North America are that 20% of the people living with HIV are women, but in the United States, the rate is higher at around 25% of the epidemic. When we look at how women get infected with HIV in the United States, you can see that the vast majority are infected through heterosexual sexual activity. About 14% are infected through injection drug use. In addition, if you look at this map, you will see that there are geographic aspects of the epidemic in women in the United States. 
The epidemic appears to be concentrated along the East Coast, but most especially in the Southeast quadrant of the United States. The next trend that I'd like to talk about is decreasing death rates. This has happened over the years and is related to access to testing and appropriate services. The primary reason that the death rates are dropping is because we have developed newer and better ways of treating the disease. Antiretroviral therapy has shown a great increase not only in the number of drugs but also in the efficacy of those drugs over time. And this graph shows that the higher the use of antiretroviral therapy, the lower the death rate. A side effect of decreasing death rates, of course, is that people live longer. The blue columns on this chart show the number of people who are 50 years of age or older who are living with HIV. In fact, if we added all four of the blue columns together, we would get a total of 8,440 people, which would make it the tallest column in the chart. Another way to look at the aging of the epidemic in the United States is to look at the projected percentages of people 50 years of age and older who will be represented in the statistics as the epidemic progresses. In 2011, about 37% of the U.S. epidemic were 50 years of age or older. This number is expected to increase to 50% in 2015 and to 70% in 2020. The final point I would like to make is that all health care providers are HIV care providers. We all have responsibilities in the epidemic. One of our responsibilities is to assess risk. If we should find that a patient has a risk for HIV infection, we need to engage behavior change and harm reduction practices to help the patient recognize the risk, understand the risk, and take steps to decrease the risk. It is important to include HIV in the differential diagnosis. The signs and symptoms of HIV infection are similar to the signs and symptoms of many other diseases. If HIV is not on the differential list, the diagnosis may be missed. It is, of course, important to diagnose HIV infection. This is done through appropriate testing methods. The CDC recommends that all patients between the ages of 13 and 64 be tested for HIV at least once. They should be tested more often if risk assessment or symptoms indicate a need. Should a patient be found to be HIV infected, we need to provide care and services. But don't worry, you're not alone. There are consultation and referral resources out there for any provider who needs assistance taking care of a person living with HIV infection. This audio slide set is part of a series produced by the Mountain Plains AIDS Education and Training Center.